held me in your arms and wiped away my tears. Not even in a million years can I ever repay you for what you've done for me. You were there when I fell, but there was no place for me. You were there to show me how to truly believe in the miracle of creation, in the good and the bad. Oh, how I love you, Mom and Dad. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome back to Outstanding Parents here at Huda TV. And I'm Nadir bin Nasib, your host and uh, founder of OutstandingMuslimParents.com. And this is the zone that we stretch and encourage you to become outstanding. Because who wants to be average anyway? Especially when you know that average is the top of the bottom and the bottom of the top. But alhamdulillah, today we're going to talk about age-specific discipline and why children crave structure. So if... That sounds exciting to you, like yippee! <laughs> then uh, you might be looking at the, the wrong thing right now. But nevertheless, this is going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. We're going to talk about a number of different strategies. But make sure you have something right on and something to write with. So here's the challenge. Um, I don't know your background or where you are in the world right now, but I know that there are a number of different techniques that that tend to work and get the type of results that we like. Now, what happened to We can only really control ourselves. We can't control anyone else, but we can attempt to influence them and inspire them, especially our children. Because again, you remember those three roles that we talked about that we have as parents. Number one is that celebrity, or that role model, that person that's everybody to this child, especially when they're very young. So we need to be exerting our influence at that early age. Two is that confidant, the one who lets them know what's kind of really going on, how to read between the lines and expose or expand their thinking and what they see. Basically what we're doing is uh, expanding their vision as opposed to just their sight. Most people can see with their eyes, but it really takes someone special to really have vision, all right? The third thing, or the third role, is to have, be a coach. And with that coach, again, we know about cheerleading and having that discipline. So today is going to be a mix of more the celebrity and the coach. OK, now what I mean by age specific discipline. Now, keep in mind that discipline must be differentiated between punishment. So you have discipline and you have punishment. Now, I know sometimes the words get intermingled or mixed, but they do have distinct meanings. And Punishment can fit in there with discipline somewhere. However, it's best to keep them separate because discipline can really be uh, described as the Muslim specialty. Discipline. So before I heard about it um, and knew anything about Islam, I knew that Muslims were disciplined. I saw Malcolm X and stuff like that. I was like, you know, Muslims are really disciplined. They have to get up early and think about it, right? Muslims are disciplined. We have discipline formed in our deen. We have to get up. We have to offer salah. And salatul fajr comes in at dawn. Salat Aisha comes in at night. You know, we have to offer salat five times a day, and it's best to do them on time. It takes discipline, doesn't it? To know when it's time for salat, perform wudu, to go ahead and do it, to, to offer salat and everything like that. That's just dealing with salat. What about siyam or fasting during Ramadan? You know, that takes another form of discipline, doesn't it? Yep, there are rules, there are regulations that we must follow. And, you know, when we can break the fast or if we're traveling and stuff like that. But you know what? That is discipline. Discipline is a specialty for Muslims to restrict ourselves from certain things, to lower our gaze and to be disciplined in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, looking for the ultimate reward. OK, so discipline is a part of our deen and really a part of our nature, if you will. As human beings, you can't just do anything you want to do. All right. Again, that's if you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet said to Islam. Alayhi salatu wasalam said, if you have no shame, then do as you wish. If you have no shame, then do as you wish. And that was not uh, letting you know to just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. That's letting you know that you don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to have a problem. All right. So nevertheless, what does it have to do with our children? Well, a lot. Because the children, 
want independence. They want to do what they want to do. They, they are bundles of sensation and they really lack clear understanding, especially at the early ages. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them understanding as they grow older, as they come of age and go through puberty and so on. They begin to understand a lot more. And that's just the way we're designed. Now, age specific. This is what I've come to find that patience is a must. <laughs> it is a necessity. One is difficult for us to remember when we were causing the same type of stress for our parents. And sometimes our parents will remind us of the stress <laughs> that they went through with us when they see what our children are putting us through. And they, sometimes they call that sweet revenge. OK, so what we, we must be patient, number one. And then also recognize that discipline is necessary because children need certainty. They need to know that when they do something, or they know that their parent is going to respond or be in a certain way or a certain fashion. They don't, it, it's very difficult and challenging to work with someone who's all over the board emo emotionally. So if you wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, and all of a sudden the person's crying for no apparent reason, or you wake up in the morning and the person is jumping all over the place or is angry, you know, children need certainty. They need to know that there's a level of stability in the emotional makeup of their parents. So when it comes to discipline, a few different things. I mentioned before to be able to control your state, your state of mind, your state of being, where if you're somebody who yells all the time, the kids get you upset and you yell, 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 and you might get hoarse and you're just all over the place and you're super stressed out and they see that and they don't really pay any mind, change your state, get control. I've talked about control your anger, control yourself. Well, let's do that. Because now that is an interruption of your children's methods or interruption of your children's pattern. So let's switch and change their pattern right away. Because if we do that, now they have to think. They're paused. You've done something different. Well, here's the deal. Should they get you upset? Should they go to another level? Now the question comes as the parent, what should I do about it? Sometimes there's the challenge of going too hard where it goes into the punishment, and the punishment doesn't necessarily fit the crime or the breaking of the rule. Other times, it's, oh, well, you know, they're young and don't do anything, which just lets them run wild, which doesn't provide structure. Now, there are different types of families you'll see and their children, and you can tell their behavior really based on, well, you can tell their behavior based on looking at them, because you might take your children to the masjid, of course, for different functions, but then the children run all over the place, don't have respect for people, bumping into stuff, not listening to their parents when they call them, and they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old. They're above the age to know better uh, with their behavior, but if they haven't been taught better, it's a bad reflection on the parents and on the family. So again, children crave structure. So how can we best take advantage of that, especially when it comes to discipline? Well, this is what I've learned. I've learned that the younger they are, of course, the softer we are because they lack that understanding. And if you have children of, of multiple ages like I do, you have teenagers all the way down to, you know, a year old, then you could obviously understand, you know, a year old or five or six and so on is going to be treated differently than someone who's a teenager or a preteen even, right? Levels of understanding are different. Well, one thing that tends to be pretty good for children about four years and up is to be able to condition their bodies and their minds at the same time. <laughs> this is what I mean. If my children do something that's wrong, they, they fight amongst each other and they know better than doing it, they insult um, anybody in the family and stuff like that, they call someone stupid, you know, the sibling rivalry stuff. Children do it, <clears throat> my children do it, it's likely your children do it too. They're being children, right? They lack proper understanding and respect at a certain age. As they're growing and being conditioned, it's our job again as parents to help them establish their Islamic identity and train them in the proper Islamic adapt. But nevertheless, they fight, their sibling rivalry stuff goes on. And here's, here's a, a quote, or not a quote, but here's a bit of information for you. Our children are gonna be part of sibling rivalry or have competition with each other, just like pretty much any other family. And if you don't believe it, think about the very first person whose children were in sibling rivalry that led to murder. We talking about Prophet Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. All right, we talking about Cain and Abel, where Cain killed Abel. I mean, the first murderer was taking part in getting a piece of every single murder that has happened since then. He started that. 
You know what I'm saying? That's that's a serious sibling rivalry. I don't think we're at that at that point. You know, <laughs> may a lot to protect us from that. But they may seem like they want to kill each other, but they're just you know being siblings. So what we do to really gain control of it is this. One thing I really really like that has caused me to you know really release less anger in a situation and less energy put toward correcting a behavior is strengthening strengthening their bodies. So if my son son Salahuddin does something wrong he knows it's wrong he shouldn't have done it he's already been warned mind you the parents should be patient so they have to discuss with them the behavior and what was going on and why they did it was it wrong and, and have them answer the question so they can own up to it and take responsibility as opposed to making excuses so they should always be warned and talk to and discuss first but there's only so far discussion is going to be able to go so if there's only a certain uh, level of time that a discussion is valid until and they va violate the same behavior, well, it's time to go deeper with the, the penalty, right? Now it's time for discipline. Well, let's say Salahuddin does something he's not supposed to do. He's called somebody a name or he's hit one of his brother or his sister and so on and anything like that, right? Well, what I'm going to encourage Salahuddin to do is get on the wall. Now, that doesn't mean go jump up on the wall and do a Spider-Man. No. What it means is he's going to get into the deep mabu or the deep horse position, the kung fu position, where he bends his knees almost parallel to the ground like this, right? And it's actually even a little bit lower. And he's on the wall, his back to the wall, so he's feeling the stress in his legs, but his legs are building up as well as his shoulders. Now he feels the lactic acid in his body, okay? And inshallah to Allah, we'll talk about the importance of lactic acid and concentration once we come back from the break. So again, strengthening the body while strengthening your mind is very wise. And we'll continue, inshallah to Allah, as soon as we come back. Don't miss it. See you in a second, inshallah. Oh, how I love you, mama. Three, two, one. What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up? As the firefighter uses what to control fire? Water or rocks? Now these two teams go head to head on pulling the blue rope. Now if one person goes over this line right here, the other team loses. Very simple rules. This challenge is worth five points. What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up as a Muslim man? Fun is for everyone. So get ready to have some fun. Check out these cool competitions between kids. It's important to have fun, and it's also important to be a good sport. So tune in to Fun for Everyone. You don't want to miss it. What will I be when I grow up as a Muslim What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up? What will I be when I grow up as a Muslim Oh, how I love you, Mom and Dad. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Now, right before the break, we talked about the wisdom of training the mind and the body. We talked about Deep Mabu, where that's a deep horse stance, uh, and it trains the mind and the body. Matter of fact, I'll demonstrate it for you one more time so you can see it from the front and so that you can see it from the side. Because Alhamdulillah, it's a very simple technique. It's, it's a part of Kung Fu, but we from here down parallel in this position. Okay, this is not easy, all right? And this is from the side, so you can see the position. And the children's backs usually on the wall. Now, with that lactic acid building up in their legs and in their shoulders and arms, it's building strength, okay? And we want our children to be strong. Now, they didn't expect to receive this type of exor exercise when they were committing the bad behavior or whatever it is we're attempting to correct. So, what I usually do is have a conversation because when your body is going through this type of strengthening, uh, the lactic acid is building up and, and they're filling it in their bodies and it helps them to concentrate now mentally because they want to st stay still. But it's kind of hard if, if you start shaking and stuff like that. You've been on there for maybe one minute even is enough uh, to get you going. So have a conversation about the behavior 
And we're having a conversation about concentration and thinking before they do something like this. That type of thing, well, alhamdulillah, has proven very effective for my family. So effective that when two of my daughters that tend to get into it more than anyone else in the house, when they argue, they're in that position, I might have them hold something, hold some books or hold something, hold it over their head, talk to each other, talk it out, okay? They apologize to each other in that position. And it, <laughs> when you first do it, it may be hilarious, okay? But well, alhamdulillah, it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not it's hilarious. The thing that matters is that it's effective. OK, so you also get to notice which children are getting stronger through the process because they can last longer uh, on the wall, if you will, uh, without falling or without going down and stuff like that. So that's one of the positions. The other position that I also suggest and have my children do are put in push up position or plank. OK, and yoga is called plank, where it's just hands on the ground up in a push up position basically like that off the ground and having to stay in a flat position, not butt up in the air, not butt hanging down, you're flat. Because guess what? You feel that throughout your body. You have to tighten up, tense, tense your abs up. You have to have, have your shoulders, you have to breathe properly. You really, again, it works on strengthening the body. But more importantly, what I'm going for is that discussion time because we need to talk about why you're in this position right now. Why did you choose to be in this position? And when I understood when I was a teenager, somebody asked me, you know, why did you choose to do that? And these are the consequences. And I said, I didn't choose to, to really do it. But the person eventually convinced me that I did choose to do it because I took the action that led to this result that I didn't like or the consequence. So now I'm teaching my children that based upon the actions that they, t that they took at the time, now they're in this position. So they chose these consequences. So if they're dissatisfied with it, they have nobody to blame but themselves. And it's very important to teach responsibility. So now with this type of discipline, whether it's in the plank position, whether it's in deep my bow, whether you use any other type of martial arts, horse stances or, or whatever, it really doesn't necessarily matter when it comes to it. What matters is that you have full attention. The body's strengthening. It's not beating it down. The body is strengthening, but you have the full attention of that child. And with the full attention of the child, now you can speak. They can't focus on other things or trying to come with different uh, conniving types of lies because well, alhamdulillah, one of the benefits of the one of the benefits is that it is hard for you to tell a lie when your body is in these different types of positions. For example, if you're going, there's been numerous studies done when it comes to touch and when it comes to the body. And one of the studies I'm talking, I'm going to talk about two, but one of the studies talked about um, having your arms up. So you have your arms up and your eyes closed and someone asks you a question and you're told to, you know, give a different answer than what the truth is, right, for the study. So what happens is that a person will come and they will hold their arm and they will ask a question. So their arms will be up. The person would basically tap with two fingers their arm. And if they're not telling the truth, then the arm's going to go down. The body's going to weaken when it tells a lie. SubhanAllah, the body weakens. Okay? When they're telling the truth, they'll stay firm on the truth. However, when they lie, arms go down. Interesting study. Another study talked about the power of touch, where back, this was like, I think in uh, the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, but there, were tele there used to be telephones and phone booths <laughs> all over the place prior to the birth of the cellular phone or the mobile phone. So people have to go in and put change in uh, a phone, a phone, you know, telephone, a pay phone is what it was called. So what they did was they put maybe like $2 of change inside a pay phone because people would habitually just check to see if there's some change left in a, in a pay, pay phone slot. I forget what it's called, but I used to do it when I was younger as well. You should just check and sometimes you might find a quarter or two or whatever. You find some cash in there. Well, what they did is they put about $2 in there. What they monitored different phone booths and they saw some individuals and they, they checked it and they went ahead and took the money, put it in their pockets. Then they approached them and they just asked them, hey, did you, did you notice any, uh, was there any money left in that phone booth? Now, interestingly enough, 90% of people that were just simply asked the question if there was money left in the phone booth said no. They lied, okay? Then there was about 10% that said, yeah, you know there was, and they gave the money back. Here's the interesting part of the study. The same setup was there the only difference is instead of just asking them a question whether or not there was some money there, they went up to the individual and just kind of put their hand on their arm 
And as they put their hand on their arm and said, you know, was there any money found in the phone booth? 97% of the individuals said yes and turned over the money to the people. So it's amazing how our bodies are already wired for the truth. Okay? So we can get the truth out of our children during this time that they're stressed when they have lactic acid going through their body and <laughs> going to their muscles and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm laughing, I'm giggling because it's funny because it doesn't matter if your child is a teenager or if they're young. You know, it doesn't matter. If I got in a deep my bowl for a couple of minutes right here, I would begin to sweat and my lactic acid will kick in. That's just how we are. Of course, depending on the violation or the rule that was broken or the, the level of behavior, what happened may cause for uh, more serious measures to be taken. But I wanted to just mention that because that doesn't take uh, much time and effort from you as an adult. It takes discipline on your part to go ahead and make sure it's done properly, to speak with them, to help them understand the lesson and take responsibility and to get and gain agreement that they won't do that behavior again unless they choose to be in this position again. And they likely will choose because they're children, they're being trained and they're learning and we forget and we go back to it. However, you know, you're teaching at the same time, you're strengthening their bodies. So well, alhamdulillah, I'm telling you, that is a very, very effective thing. If you haven't tried it, try it. And let's see what happens. Now, I want to talk also about structure when it comes to chores. Now, first off, bedtimes are a necessity. When it's time to go to sleep, it needs to be time to go to sleep. Children don't know what's the best. They don't have the proper understanding. So to not have a specific bedtime is not good for them. Not going to be able to get up early on time, have the proper energy it takes, and there's no need for them to be up late. What's the purpose, right? So you're going to get up later and offer salat. Now, I'm talking about preteens and young teenagers, okay? So let's talk about chores. Well, I suggested that psh, maybe three years old, you start the rotation of chores, making it fun, making it a game, making it a family activity. Say, so, you know, if you just have one child and you're doing dishes and, you know, father's cutting the grass and they're so on or mowing the lawn, then, hey, the child can go and get the different trash bins from around the home, bring them to one major trash bin, put it in that, feel good about themselves. Right. Get praise. Get a high five. If you have more than one, you make it a game again. You know, have them race to do it. or You have one do the uh, the trash bins and someone else has to wipe down the sinks. OK, so the, the easier that you make it to be fun. The easier you can replace yourself. Now, I'm a strong believer in that chores should first be replacing the mother. The mother has some of the heaviest responsibility out there. So when it comes to Usually, I'm saying usually, I'm speaking stereotypically because I know the dynamics of families, usually a lot of the weight lies on the mother. It can be the father, but that's the minority, okay? So not, you know, if you're the father, you're busting and you're getting it done, alhamdulillah, that's great. That's just not how it normally is um, across the board. So if you're the mother, these people should be replacing you. I Meaning if you're already going and you're washing the dishes a lot, well, as soon as you get somebody of dishwashing age, which means you have to train them, now of course, the first time they wash dishes is going to be the worst for them. So the first time is going to be the worst time. However, they should be able to replace you. Now, I've seen children as young as four or five years old begin to wash dishes and dry them off, put stuff up, and so on. Well, if that's the case, I like that the wife or the mother tends to get relief. I don't like to see my wife washing dishes. There's no need for her to wash dishes. We have a gang of dishwashers in the house. Okay, they're all qualified to wash dishes, but sometimes she does it out of habit. But I talk to my, my children about, hey, why is we washing dishes? There's no need for her to wash the dishes. Okay, so the chore should be replacing and making the job easier for the mother. The mother shouldn't still be doing your laundry. You're a teenager, mother's doing your laundry. Matter of fact, as a teenager, you can be doing an entire house's laundry and setting that system up. You should be doing it. Okay, there are costs to living in the house and being part of that family, being part of that team. And when you are of age enough to assist, which again, I suggest starts at three, four years old, become part of that family culture, is now you have a house that works together. You praying together, you recharge yourselves after salat, you work it together, you get in rewards. Well, alhamdulillah, it should be no reason if a mother of six or five or four or three even has teenagers and preteens, but is washing all the dishes and cooking all the food and doing all the laundry. No, 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 no. We have to lighten that load up for mom. She's more than a mom and has other parts of her life, right? So it's important that we establish the chores in that structure because that also teaches them how to be independent once they do leave the house. Because eventually they will leave the house. 
We don't want to be parents that just put all of our lives into our children, don't have other things going on in our life, and now the children go out and they can't function. They don't know how to wash dish or uh, prepare some food or keep their clothes clean. No, we don't want to enable our children to be dysfunctional, okay? So we want to make sure we put a program in place early, give them the little things they can do and can be proud of that is within their reach, and show them how to do it. Even if they don't do it good, praise them on it until they get good. Because we all were ignorant at first until we became intelligent and good over time. So with that, well, alhamdulillah, we want you to make sure, we want to make sure that you go to outstandingmuslimparents.com slash structure to get the worksheet that goes with today's episode and get some different ideas when it comes to chores and, and really engaging your family and building that structure and learning some good discipline tips as well. So jazakumullah khair, make sure outstandingmuslimparents.com slash structure. We appreciate you being here. Remember, a wish changes nothing, but a decision changes everything. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Nadir bin Naseeb signing off. While my world was crumbling down And you tried your best to shelter me From the coming of the storm You opened my eyes to see That all hope was not gone You held me in your arms and wiped away my tears Not even in a million years Can I ever repay you For what you've done for me You were there when I fell That there was no place for me You were there to show me How to truly the miracle of creation in the good